I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. Of course, as the great teacher Thich Nhat Hanh, bless his memory, has pointed out, everything is always continuing in endlessly changing forms. And life is so much about two things fundamentally, uh, dealing with the fact that almost everything falls apart eventually, while at the same time, some things endure, and we can find ways to be with and practice with, be sensible about the facts that most things fall apart eventually, while at the same time, increasingly grounding ourselves and appreciating and surrendering to and being lived by that which endures, the two together. The two together are really central in practice. There is a continuing, ongoingly, of both, right? Of both the falling apartness of things and the enduring of that which endures. Both of those continue. So one thing that also continues is suffering and the movement of compassion to relieve it. And I wanted to mention to you, uh, as you can see in the chat that I put at 6.45 or 45 minutes past the hour, this new initiative, this new global movement that I'm helping uh, with others to establish, the Global Compassion Coalition. And I bring it to your attention. Uh, you may have gotten an email from me about it already. You may have heard about it from other sources. A remarkable, extraordinary group of people worldwide is gathering and growing to develop this new commons, a new global commons in which people and organizations around the world can join together for the greater good in an historically unprecedented scale. So you might be interested in globalcompassioncoalition.org. Check out the website, maybe after my talk tonight, and um, join us. Please become a member, it's free, of this um, just unprecedented movement for compassionate action at the world scale. So that's the first thing I wanted to mention. Another thing that, as you well know, continues is the good news and the bad news of other people. Good news, there are other people. Bad news, there are other people. And what do we do about this? So as you know, I'm exploring with you a whole series of talks and discussions uh, this year on the fundamental topic of how do we live together? How do we actually do that amidst our differences, our conflicts, our politics, the challenges of the world? How do we actually do that? And um, this week, last week I talked about generosity, and this week I wanna talk about disentangling. A common metaphor used by the Buddha was about getting tangled and then untangling, partly by recognizing the space between the threads. And I want to explore with you four simple, powerful ways to disengage from, disentangle from different situations, different relationships, from disentangling from different aspects maybe of a particular relationship while staying engaged with other aspects of that relationship. So I'm gonna explore with you four really good ways to do this and also some ways to engage in, to rest yourself in that which is helpful and wholesome. It's a deep topic. And then maybe we'll even have a chance to talk about some examples of this in the chat or with um, particular people who might want to speak with me for a few minutes. So to jump into this, let's think of a couple of examples. So I encourage you to, um, to think of this yourself. Recently, 
I got tangled in a situation in a team of people in which I was pressing too hard for certain good things to happen. And, you know, there were interactions that were complicating things and tangling me up and in my mind, even. I was tangled up. And there were different things that led me to do it, good reasons and not so good reasons. Uh, but nonetheless, there was a tangle, right? It just, meh. And sometimes you recognize that uh, you're tangled up in something because what you're trying to do isn't happening or your efforts are not helping. Maybe they're even making things worse. Uh, or you might be in a situation where you just start to realize that, you know, you're never going to find any cheese <laughs> down that particular tunnel. Time to make a change. Or maybe you just start to realize that, you know, you're paying too high a price. It's just not worth it. Yeah, maybe you could keep trying to squeeze a little more juice from that particular orange, but you're getting tired, it's stressful, and your energies, your time, your attention, maybe your money, could be better spent elsewhere, more productively than over here where you're kind of caught up in something. Uh, you might think about particular situations where you've gotten into a tangle with somebody, trying to make something happen that isn't happening, or maybe getting caught up in trying to make something happen inside their mind, and they don't want it to happen there. That's an example. Um, another example is getting caught up in a certain position about someone or something that you're really right about. You've gotten identified with it. One of the markers of getting tangled up is a sense of contraction in your own body or with it, and potentially with it, a kind of insistence, a certain must about things being a, being a certain way or certain results occurring. These are different examples. And by the way, I, I invite you to put into the chat your own examples of people or interactions or situations that you've gotten stuck in, right? That's what we're talking about, getting stuck, looping through the same old um, scripts with other people, uh, caught in similar interactions again and again with your parents or your children or your siblings or relatives or the neighbor. Uh, you find yourself talking uh, at the television set. That's an example of a certain kind of entanglement. These are just different kinds of tangles, right? And it's important to be clear, I'm not speaking against um, <clears throat> making strong efforts, even in the face of resistance. There's some kind of saying that politics is the slow, boring, politics in a democratic society is the slow boring of hard wood. We have to do the slow boring, right? We have to engage in what John Lewis called good trouble, bless his memory. I'm not speaking against that. I'm not speaking against really sustaining a strong effort over time for to, toward a greater, a greater purpose. Um, I am talking about what do we do when we just realize for ourselves, for whatever complex reasons, that inner wisdom, that still quiet voice inside us says, you know, it's time to back out. It's time to disengage. It's time to disentangle. What do we do then? When it's clear for you in your heart, you need to make a shift. How can you do it? What helps you do it? The first of the four things that I'm going to suggest is the very practical you know, suggestion of slow it down. Just that, slow it down, can help. Slow down interactions. I made a mistake recently of uh, reading an email 
and I get so many emails, I tend to start with the most recent ones, which means sometimes I miss the context that came in four hours before, before I get to that email, literally 50 emails down sometimes. And uh, so I made a mistake and I saw an, an email about something that was very concerning and internally I sped up, I accelerated about it. One of the major markers of the stress response, one you know, uh, is accelerating. Another marker is dramatically slowing down and freezing, but it's much more common for us to move into accelerating. So accelerating is a giveaway often that you're moving into a stress response. And so um, I sped up inside myself rather than slowing down, and I sped up and sent out a reply that was premature and missed a lot of the important context and created some trouble that I didn't need, including my own kind of regret and remorse that I'd pushed the button. That's an example. As a longtime couples counselor, so much of what I'm trying to do is get, is get couples to slow down. So much of what I've tried to learn in 40 years of marriage is to slow down and to make room for the other person and, and also discern what's really happening and the complexities of it and the context that maybe I'm missing. Slowing down is really helpful in that way. And slowing down also really aids, um, you know, regulating our impulses and not saying that thing or doing that thing or coming out with that kind of speedy, accelerated gesture that for another person just feels invasive and scary sometimes even and inappropriate and way out of proportion to what happened. Slow it down. Slow your roll. Uh, Tara Brock calls this the sacred pause. We're just slowing it down, even slowing down the rate of speech. <sighs> Once in a while, we really do need to grab our baby and run out of a burning building. Once in a while, we really do need to swerve quickly to the right to get away from that car that's moving into our lane. But most of the time, we just don't need to jump so fast. We can take a breath or two or 10 to slow it down and see what's going on. All that is really supportive of a kind of disengagement, healthy disengagement, healthy disentangling. Slow it down. Second is see the big picture. Neurologically, as I've talked about, getting a sense of things as a whole, and also visually raising your gaze to the horizon, or more generally, third, imagining a kind of panoramic perspective uh, on the whole situation the various people involved, the bigger picture, the real priorities, your highest values, taking a wider view, a big picture view, really helps us to disengage from the part of the whole that we've gotten stuck on and has taken us hostage in some sense or hijacked us, right? because that's the structure of so much of our problematic interactions or relationships or suffering. We've gotten stuck to something. As soon as you go into the hole, you've moved away from the part. Uh -huh. And neurologically, what that does among many good things is it reduces activity in the midline networks of the brain that support uh, rumination and resentments and self-criticism and woulda, coulda, shoulda, you know, that get us stuck in different situations, real interactions and relationships. So going out to the whole. The meditation we did was a very beautiful practice of moving out to the whole infused with the heart in which we can find a beautiful happiness in the midst of all that. That's a very powerful practice. And the more we dwell in, those, in the cultivation of 
spaciousness, openness, heartfeltness, and a sweet happiness in the midst of it all. The more that those qualities dwell within us, become established in us increasingly, as the Buddha taught, and as you've probably discovered for yourself, and many others have taught about aspects of this as well, including recently neuroscientists and neuropsychologists uh, like myself. So that's my second suggestion, right? See the big picture. That helps to disentangle. Third, I'll put it this way, make your offering. Say what you need to say. Go on the record if you need to. Uh, make the point. Uh, take action in some simple way or in a way that makes sense to you. Do what you consider best with thought, word, and deed. Make your offering. That's, that's a way to help disengage. It breaks cycles of um, taking action, in other words. Break cycles of helpless fuming that really entangle us with others. Helpless outrage, sputtering. Brrr, why brrr. That's really not good for us and it's not productive, right? Doesn't accomplish anything to just kind of fume. Brrr. Smoke's coming out of your ears. Brrr. Much better to decide for yourself what's the appropriate plan, which could well be a lot of clarity inside yourself about what you're going to do next time if this ever happens again, and to prepare for the next time and to know how you intend to conduct yourself. Even imagining yourself acting how you want to act, um, maybe writing down some key words that are guidance for yourself, like stay cool, let them look bad, <laughs> you know. Uh, imagine, you know, that your kids are going to be watching a video of this in 10 years and how do you want to look, right? Uh, whatever helps you, you know, to take the appropriate action that you want to take, make your offering. Know that you've, you've said or done or thought what you want to. That really helps in so many ways. Um, in the situation I'm describing for myself, it became clear to me that there really was a, we could say, stake on the table. There really was, in other words, an important substantive pointed issue. And I simply clarified in a, in a, kind of, in a direct way that was um, very clear and concrete what needed to happen or a standard that needed to be met which the other people involved immediately agreed to. Oh, fine. But that one clarity that was my offering into the situation, which was the one important priority, really, around which I had been fuming foolishly. <laughs> oh, well. Um, that was the one point of clarity that really mattered. And I, I made that offering and, and having stated it, having established, in effect, a boundary or declared a healthy position that enabled me then to step back because, you know, I knew that either it would happen or it wouldn't, but I declared myself uh, in this particular situation, which, oof, helped me come to peace about it. So you might think about this. In situations that are aggravating to you or entangling, you've been around with a lot, hey, what's the action to take? Action is really clarifying, if only inside your own mind. You know, I've been reminding myself lately inside my own mind, you know, my own, the action I'm taking, which is it doesn't help if I get aggravated. It doesn't help if I get pushy. Uh, and in a certain sense, it's it's, there's the great teaching coming through um, T.S. Eliot's poem, in which he said, says, teach us to care and not to care. You know, we can care too little and we can care too much. And the combination of caring and not caring, compassion and equanimity, is often where we find our footing. And then last, I'm going to use a certain loaded phrase here, last of four, 
uh, that I offer to you uh, about disentangling is give up. Give up. And what I mean by that is not apathy or turning a blind eye to injustice. I mean it in the, in the embodied sense of surrender to what you can control and what you can't. Uh, giving up about another person just clearly going to continue being a certain way. Give up about it. Stop fighting what isn't going to change. Quit banging your head against the wall. Give up. And this feeling of giving up in the healthy sense, not in a sense of despair, but in a sense of it is what it is. I surrender. I surrender. It's very freeing and peaceful in that way. We, we give up about other people being certain ways. We give up that we will never get a certain kind of acknowledgement or admission of fault or um, lovingness or, or some particular behavior that we want. They will never give us our money back maybe. Um, you know, I was ripped off for $3,000 in 1977. And $3,000 then for a guy who was 26 was a lot of money. Uh, and, on, you know, I, I was never going to get that money back. I'll never get it back. I give up. <laughs> it doesn't mean that I like it or that think the other person was, you know, a good person about it. Uh, they exploited me and ripped me off. Uh, but I, you know, there's a place where you just give up and know what it feels like to give up. It's helpful to start with, uh, you know, certain things that might be easy. Like I'm looking at, you know, the pad on my desk here and I give up about, you know, anti-gravity you know, in this pad floating in the air, right? I, you know, I, I give up. It's funny. It's kind of silly, but you know what it feels like. Know what it feels like to give up. And imagine giving up about certain things with certain people and how that might feel for you in a healthy way. You might choose other words perhaps that work better for you like acceptance or letting go, surrendering, releasing. Whoosh. It can help sometimes to embody this with actions like whoosh, gestures of release or, you know, just hands up. I give up. Just, okay. Whoosh. Uh, letting go. Imagining holding something that's heavy and painful and letting it go. Um, turning it over. Um, you know, there's a, there's a saying, let go, let God. You know, if that's meaningful for you, just give it over to the universe. Give it over to reality. Let go. Let go. I give up. You might even play with saying that in your mind or even out loud about a particular thing. You know, I give up about this particular fact or I give up about a terrible loss um, I'm thinking about right now. I give up. <laughs> I give up about my own nature, right? We can kind of give up like, oh, yeah, you know, I am a certain kind of way. I have certain genetics. I have certain life history. Certain things happened to me that shaped me. I'm still carrying the scars. I'm still managing that injury. I give up about who I am. I give up about the nature of the mind, you know, the imperfectibility of the ordinary mind. I give up trying to perfect it. I give up. You might play with that. Maybe write it out, I give up, about, you might say it out loud, whatever comes to you, and especially the giving up that brings you peace. Yeah. So a quick recap, uh, four ways to disentangle uh, from situations, uh, interactions, and sometimes relationships. Uh, slow it down. 
slow it down. Second, go to the big picture, move out to the, have a wider view, panoramic perspective, which includes your, your real priorities, your real values. Third, make your offering. Take action as you see fit in with thoughts, words, and deeds. Decide how you'll be next time. Um, speak your mind and leave it be. Focus on maybe the most important point and establish that one. Set that boundary, declare that position. Make your offering, knowing that after you make it, there's you cannot control most of what happens next. And then last, give up in ways that bring you peace and, and are wise. So those are four ways to disengage, four ways to disentangle. And you can see implicitly in all of them, therefore, they are four ways to reduce the craving and contraction around the self that brings suffering and harm, as the Buddha taught. And then, as I finish here for a few more minutes and I'll open it up, what do we engage in or with? If we are disengaging from some things, disentangling from some things, what do we engage in, right? And I want to suggest three things that for me certainly have been really meaningful. Um, refuges and uh, wellsprings of well-being and healing, and I think wisdom as well. Uh, they also are increase the odds of a good result with other people while not being a guarantee. The first of these is sincerity. Being genuine, being real, and knowing that you're not playing any games, you're not trying to manipulate anybody through deception, you're, you can take refuge in your sincerity. There's a fundamental honesty, a fundamental genuineness, authenticity. That's a really underrated thing. Uh, I grew up in LA and there were certain aspects of uh, being around the whole entertainment industry where sincerity was in short supply. And I think of the wonderful line in the movie, Almost Famous, in which this kind of grizzled, uh, curmudgeonly character says to the you know, young man who's the major character, uh, something close to um, the only real currency in this messed up world is what we do and say when we're not trying to be cool. Sincerity. Second, and, and again, you might think about, okay, how sincere are you actually being in these situations, interactions, or relationships? And what would happen if you just took refuge in and rested in a simple, plain-spoken, open-hearted, undefended sincerity? I just feel so many conflicts and problems at all scales in this world would be eased. We need other things as well, but a major easing would be simple sincerity. Think about how politics gets corrupted in ostensible democracies, purported democracies. Our politics get corrupted when um, insincerity is not called out and punished in some consequential way. And when um, the referees sitting on the sidelines are not willing to identify clearly who is consistent, who is sincere, who keeps telling the truth, and who does not. You know. So, sincerity. Second is good-heartedness. Resting in your own good heart, knowing that, you know, like, yeah, I have some bad habits. Yeah, I can get a little reactive. Yeah, if I'm tired and I care too much about something, I can get kind of intense, kind of pointed. 
exasperated. All right, but I know underneath it all, there's a good heart. So knowing your own good heart is really useful. You can engage your good heart and you can know you have a good heart. Even if other people are not so sure or they're, you know, they don't tune into that about you, but you can know inside yourself that you're coming from good heartedness. You're coming from good faith related to sincerity. You're coming from bodhicitta in that term in Buddhism. You know, uh, basically bodhi means wakefulness and citta means consciousness or mind generally, like a wakeful mind. You're coming from a wakeful, warm-hearted uh, mind, way of being, resting in your own good heart. And then third and last suggestion for what to engage in is good company. Wow, the good company of nature, uh, the good company of the, our ancestors, including the Miwok people that have walked through my backyard um, that was stolen from them, essentially, you know, 100 or 200 years ago. I mean, we can have a sense of good company in ways that are meaningful to us, including locally with our, our true friends, our true family. Sometimes your true family is not the one you were born into or parts of it was, or maybe you've added to the true family that, you've been, that you were born into. The Buddha famously had an interaction, as I finish here, with his cousin Ananda, who was the primary memory holder of the Buddha's teachings, because Ananda apparently had an extraordinary memory. If you'll read a sutta, that begins in the voice of, thus have I heard. That's the voice of Ananda, the Buddha's attendant, primary attendant, and also his cousin. Well, one time apparently, the Buddha and Ananda and a number of other monks, uh, the male monks would gather together, um, you know, were being together. And uh, Ananda looked out there and said with joy to the Buddha, look, noble sir, this is half of the holy life you know, the other people, implying that the other half is somehow inside the, the mind. Okay. And the Buddha famously replied, not so, Ananda, not so. This is the whole of the holy life. Practicing in good company is the whole of the holy life, broadly, broadly defined. And that's the third thing we can engage in, good company. Uh, of various kinds, including this lovely gathering here online every Wednesday night. So engaging in sincerity, engaging in your good heartedness and the knowing of your good heartedness and engaging in good company uh, as you disentangle through slowing it down, seeing the big picture, making your offering and giving up. Okay. So I hope that was useful for you. These reflections have been recently extremely useful for me, and <laughs> I hope I continue to remember them. Uh, let me just take a peek at some of the comments coming in or questions. Um, other people, uh, such as uh, my friend Ole at uh, 18 minutes past the hour, are offering lovely contributions. There are other things I could have named, to be clear. The four modes of disentangling are not the only ones. And Ole uh, mentions a fifth that's, of course, wonderfully useful, forgiveness, including, by extension, forgiving yourself when that's appropriate. That's another really, really useful way to disentangle. I had an experience on retreat in which I was working through a deep sense of grievance with a very, very important person in my life. And, um, uh, you know, I was forgiving them I was forgiving them, but I wasn't getting that fundamental release where you pull the tip of the root, right? And there's a, a full release. And I realized that I also needed to forgive myself for my own conduct and my own reactivity that had gotten in the mix. I needed to forgive myself as well for that complete release, along with what enables forgiveness, which is, of course, taking maximum reasonable responsibility for whatever your part in the matter might be, which could include nothing at all. So uh, let's just see if there's anything else. Maybe someone would like to talk with me. Uh, it, if you do, if 
you have a make it please a specific, clear question that's related to what we've been exploring tonight and would be of general interest and is concise and clear. So the pressure's on. Um, so you can push the button down by the smiley face if you do want to ask a question. And maybe we'll see if there are one or two people there, maybe three at most. And I'll take a peek at what, el what else is here uh, in the chat. Yeah, lots of good comments, lots of good wisdom. I appreciate the person who called out at 13 minutes past the hour, Margaret, integrity. Uh, there's tremendous emphasis in the Buddha Dharma on integrity, being a, you know genuine and, and acting in good faith, and also uh, finding the expression of that integrity through various forms of appropriate conduct. You may have heard that the three pillars of practice, the three foundations of practice in Buddhism uh, are, in the language of early Buddhism, sila, samadhi, and panya, routinely translated as sila being restraint, morality, integrity, appropriate conduct. Sila, incredibly important. And samadhi, training of the mind, and panya, wisdom, insight, uh, at all kinds of levels. So yeah, integrity, really important. Great, maybe, let's see. Yeah, so Nancy, at 12 minutes past the hour, described something common and um, painful. Uh, by common, I don't mean to, to diminish in any way the particularities here. I just mean it's a pretty widespread issue where there's a care and concern about someone who's addicted to something, including, you know, your beloved child. And one really important aspect of making the offering is to make, for one way to do that, is to make the offering of love, to, to wish others well, who you need to really physically distance from or to wish others well who for various reasons have estranged themselves from you unfairly, unjustly. You can still wish them well even if you clearly recognize they have done you an injustice and there's no possibility of repair and you may never really see them again for the rest of your life or talk with them again, but you can still wish them well and, and that being your offering while also protecting yourself. So I see two people. Okay, I think I've spoken with you before, Elaine, which is fine. I'm asking you to unmute and I'd appreciate it if you turn your camera on. It's not necessary, but it's helpful for others. Uh, to yeah, see. It, it'll freeze my video. So. Okay, <laughs> so what's your question? Yeah, so let's see if I can frame this correctly, because this is like all of what you're saying reminds me of something I read. I don't know if you're familiar with Susan Piver or Piver. No. She's a meditation teacher, and, and I don't know very much about the Enneagram, but she okay. was speaking about the Enneagram. And what struck me is that she was having something with her partner, you know, and it was generating a lot of negative energy. And she realized, oh, I'm this number. And I always see things in a particular way. Mm. And my partner is 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 different numbering, is a different kind of category and sees things in a totally different way. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, for example, let's say if you're the kind of person who always sees the danger in something. Sure. Right. And so, so the question is so the, so the question is given that that this exists with the Enneagram, and people really function in a different way. Right. You know, like somebody wants to come up with great ideas and the other person is going, but this can go wrong and this can go wrong and this can go wrong. Right. And you're trying to come to an agreement. So you're, what to do? Like you're, right? Yes. What, is that what your question? Do? Yes. And there's more than two numbers. There's like. Oh. Sure. Oh, there. I know the system. With people so let me. Approaching, yeah. OK. So I think you're giving an example. Yes. Is it of, helpful to know that? Yeah. Of recognizing differences and. There are neurological differences in temperament. Then we have the different impacts of life experiences. Uh, people growing up as I have with various kinds of advantage that um, occur through disadvantaging others unfairly. You know, we can recognize differences. And certainly psychology, including sacred psychologies around the world, which is the deep roots of the Enneagram system, um, have also identified different 
patterns, if you will, that have a certain stability. Um, who knows? You know, maybe we could think about horoscopes or different other kinds of things. What do we do, right? Um, and one of the useful things I think you're exactly pointing to is realizing that, oh, my way of being is not a law of the universe, right? My way of being is not a mandate for everybody else to be that way. And what seems self-evident to me about priorities and how to be is not a universal rule. Like, for example, it seems self-evident to me that it's you know, efficient and aesthetically pleasing to function in a fairly uncluttered environment. It's totally not self-evident to my wife about that, right? And so similarly to her, it seems self-evident that it's not a big deal. You know, you put something down and it stays there for six months on the counter and what's the problem, you know? Uh, but to me, it's like, whoa, what's going on here? So accepting those differences I could have added that to my list of things, that although giving up. In effect, we're talking here, Elaine, right? About giving up, about the nature of another person, and then trying to negotiate our differences so that we can, in the theme of my talks this uh, year, live together. How do we live together? Partly, we have to recognize our differences and recognize that our own ways of being um, are not necessarily some kind of universal mandate. So thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. And by the way, for those who, yeah, who don't know about it, the Enneagram I find is, on the whole, take it with a grain of salt and beware of people who just pigeonhole others in that system. Um, but it's one of the more profound and powerful uh, ways of understanding personality that I've run into, which is really quite effective for understanding maybe 80% of the population. Uh, the other 20% maybe don't fit into it so neatly. Anyway, okay, Sarah, we have time for your question. So what is it? I'm asking you to unmute. There you go. Unmute yourself. Yeah, there you go. What is it? My question is, how do you dis disentangle from trauma? Because uh, that might be like, I'm thinking of my experiences and there is you like usually a person or people associated that I can try to disentangle from but the trauma, I can't. So does this apply? You're talking about disentangling from something inside yourself, right? Which other yeah. people? I guess somebody, I did see somebody ask about how you disentangle yeah. from thoughts, but I guess the personal really, trauma, I don't know. Are when you I talking about a thing, person who traumatized you, Sarah? Um, Or situations that yeah. were the result of a person. Hmm. Big questions if I follow you. So I'm going to, uh, you know, lay a little hardcore psychology research on you with some weird terminology. So in other words, very often there's a traumatic event that becomes associated with what's technically called a neutral stimulus. So for example, a car is neutral, but if you were in a car when an accident happened, maybe while driving over a bridge, a bridge also is neutral, suddenly from now on when you get back in the car, your heart starts pounding and you don't want to cross a bridge, for example. Or maybe you were with, I'm going to stereotype slightly here, but if maybe you were with a big man. Now, believe it or not, bigness and manness and the combination are neutral. They could go either way, right? But maybe a big man really hurt you or did something really invasive or was just really wrong, whatever. So then afterward, we associate our reactions to that really neutral stimulus. And that becomes really the problem in a lot of ways. So the question becomes psychologically and neurologically, how do we disentangle that connection, right? Um, so that increasingly we can be with those particular stimuli, you know, people, situations, objects, times, and so forth, in a way that doesn't, uh, you know, re stir things up again. There's a tremendous amount of psychology about that. Um, basically, the path is, one, to build up inner strengths of various kinds so that they become increasingly the habit of your heart. 
increasingly that's where you dwell, right? And especially build up strengths that are in effect antidotes to or the opposite of or compensations to whatever happened in the traumatic experience or material. So for example, there's a sense of helplessness, understandably. It's really useful to build up experiences of potency, agency, you know, power, uh, empowerment, and so forth, for example. Okay, one major path, building up resources. Second major path is to gradually snip, snip, snip at the threads that tangle uh, neutral stimuli, as it were, uh, including sometimes our own bodies or our own um, sense of person, that it tangle that to the traumatic material. So how to do that snipping? One of the most common ways is to be aware in a very graduated way, step by step by step, of the traumatic material in ways that don't re-traumatize you, while at the same time feeling something neutral or positive, right? So, and then what starts to happen is that the association of the trauma to the neutral stimulus gradually becomes counter-conditioned by repeatedly associating whatever has been different aspects of the traumatic experience to things that are uh, neutral or positive. I'm describing just a major path. I warned you, I was gonna go hardcore here and I'll finish by the last thing, which is indicated increasingly, and, and by the way, there are many different protocols, many different ways in therapies, outside of therapies, to do what I'm describing. I'm giving you the big picture strategy. What are you trying to do? You're trying to build up strengths here, and you're trying to break the chain that binds you, that the mother nature wants her little babies <laughs> to learn the chain that associates pain and upset and contraction to the trauma. So you never go down that road again back in Jurassic Park, right? But it creates a lot of unfortunate suffering today. So the last thing to finish is I call it the erasure protocol. It sounds like a Jason Bourne thriller, I know, the erasure protocol, where basically we don't just associate neutral or positive increasingly to the, to the trauma but we literally, in the brain, erase the association. We don't just cover it over or add positives to it. We literally pull the plug. I highly recommend the work of a therapist and researcher named Bruce Ecker, E-C-K-E-R, who has really gone deep into the how of doing this. Um, he has a thing called the Coherence Institute. He's, to me, you know, definitely tied for first place, and it's a short list with people who've applied brain science in practical ways to clearing old crud. So Bruce Ecker, with his colleagues, um, sorry, I'm blanking on the names of some of his colleagues, um, et cetera. So um, the, the key essentially is be aware in some manageable extent of traumatic material. You know, the feeling in your body, the memory, you know, you, you, you know your, your heart's starting to pound when you think about walking down a dark street, let's say at night. Um, be aware of it. Let it go. Let it go. And then over the next hour or so, deliberately, deliberately be aware of the neutral stimulus, in this case, a dark street, while also feeling okay while also feeling okay. And what that does, literally neurochemically, physiologically, what that does is it disrupts the reconsolidation of the trauma material in your brain. By be being aware of the trauma material or the painful material, it is being constructed into awareness for a time and then when you let go of it, it leaves awareness, it has to be reconsolidated, literally rewired into the neural nets of memory. Wow. And if you can disrupt, 
that reconsolidation through various methods over time, you literally erase it. It's kind of like pulling it out of the closet and then not letting it get back into the closet again and again and again. So I'm going to leave it there. I hope that was helpful. There's just a lot of help, you know, good psychotechnology, if you will, that um, can give us a lot of peace. Meanwhile, uh, just to finish, and thank you very much for that, Sarah, if that's okay. Uh, meanwhile, um, we can disentangle in the ways I've described and engage, root ourselves in, dwell in what's, you know, beautiful, wholesome and helpful, like sincerity, good heartedness and good company.